Most of my stories stand alone, but this one does not. Today we're going to witness a collaboration between fan-favorite characters, the Whitney Brothers, and Professor Gabby Pons, as they explore a fan-favorite location, the Hotel Moss. If you're a new listener and you'd like to get caught up before listening to this story, check out my past stories called Unnatural Dark, Intruder, Disembodied Parts 1 and 2, and Echoes. Listening to those first will make this one far more enjoyable. Thanks for listening. Gabby Pons made herself a cup of black licorice tea, folded her legs beneath herself in her plush, wingback chair, and dialed Darian Whitney. He answered on the second ring. She knew he was eager to hear from her. After she had left a message telling the Whitney brothers she might be able to get them into the Hotel Moss, they had been in near-constant contact. Could the Whitneys have just booked a room and done an investigation without permission? Possibly. However, ghost hunters had become wary of filming at the old hotel. Its current owner, a trust fund kid trying to make a name for himself, had started suing anyone who uploaded videos exposing its paranormal happenings. The lawsuits failed in court, but they succeeded in deterring YouTubers from filming at the Hotel Moss. While the hotel was ripe for content, no one wanted to be dragged in front of a judge for likes and views. While the Whitney brothers garnered YouTube popularity and social media fame, Gabby had built respect for her mostly off-camera work, which was why she thought she might succeed where the Whitneys had failed, to gain access to the Hotel Moss. If she had called the Hotel Moss a few months prior, she guessed she would have received a harsh rejection as the Whitneys had. But times had changed. Over the phone, Gabby explained the situation to Darian and his brother Reese. She began with the good news that she had secured permission to investigate the hotel. Then, she explained the unfortunate reason why. You've no doubt heard of the immigrant crisis embattling New York City? She asked. Just like headlines here and there, Reese answered. Gabby explained how New York law forced the city to house everyone. In 2023, the city had received such a massive influx of immigrants that the government was taking over hotels to use for housing. The Hotel Moss was drafted as one of these sanctuaries, but for the unfortunate immigrants who were sent there, it was anything but. There have been murders, suicides, and totally unexplainable deaths throughout the hotel's history, Gabby explained, but the rate of these tragedies increased exponentially this year. The Hotel Moss has not seen so many, well, I hate to call them guests, more like captives, in decades. It is ripe with victims. So that's why they're letting us investigate? Darian asked. The owner wants us to do more than investigate, Gabby said. He would like us to stop what's happening for good. Reese asked, is that even possible? Gabby replied, that remains to be seen. The investigative allies met for the first time at a coffee shop down the road from the hotel two days before the new year. There, they strategized how to tackle the massive hotel. From their understanding, based on internet lore, there were two main hubs for paranormal activity. Room 349 at the center, the heart of the hotel, and room 249 directly below it. 349 was also the home of Andrew Moss, the reclusive son of the hotel's proprietor, Orville. Gabby insisted that they must also investigate room 449 because, as she put it, if 249 is affected by being beneath the source, I would imagine the room above is tainted as well. What about the people living there now? What if they won't let us in? Reese asked. Gabby shrugged and said, Based on the discussion I had with the owner, that won't be an issue. They're all living in fear for their lives. They will welcome any form of hope. Are people actually staying in the bad rooms? Darian asked. Not in 349, Gabby said. Yet, somehow people keep ending up dead there. Are we in over our heads? Reese asked, staring at the table. Yeah, how are we going to clear up a 150-year-old haunting in two nights? Asked Darian. If we're making progress, I'm sure they'll let us continue beyond our currently allotted time, Gabby added but I actually don't think we'll need any more than two nights. This hotel is famously active. Contacting the spirits should not be a problem. 
the main question will be how to end the haunting. Can we really call it a haunting? Reese asked. Sipping her latte, Gabby lifted her eyes to meet Reese's. She said, I assume you've read the letter then. Do you think it's real? Darian asked. They were referring to a letter which had supposedly been written by the hotel's proprietor, Orville Moss, to his son, Andrew. In it, he claimed the Hotel Moss was built on top of a portal to hell. It sounded completely unbelievable, but so did most of the lore surrounding the hotel, including the various and mysterious deaths which had occurred there. Gabby answered, In my experience, when something claims to be from hell, it's usually hiding the truth. The Whitney brothers exchanged glances, trying to see if the other understood what the former professor meant. Let me put it this way, she continued. If someone were to stop you on the street, a mugger, and they pointed a gun at you, what would you assume? They want my wallet, Darian speculated. About the gun, said Gabby. Um, that they're going to use it? Reese guessed. Close. You would assume it's loaded, and every subsequent choice you made would be based upon that assumption. In unison, the boys said, Sure. The paranormal activity inside the Hotel Moss is the gun, and the power of hell is the bullet. We assume the haunting is loaded with hell's fury because that's the impression we're given. But I've never brushed against anything that is actually from a spiritual underworld. In my experience, the evils usually attributed to hell come from bad people. Their intentions draw negative energy to them. For example, I once aided a man who was under attack from his child's biological father. The father had committed ritual suicide with occult symbology. His energy mimicked the classic signs of a demon, but not because he had drawn upon some sort of malevolent spirit from hell. He was evil. His intentions were to cause harm. So the energy he drew from was purely negative. And this has all been proven? Darian asked. Gabby laughed. Scientifically? No, not yet. There's a reason the title of professor no longer precedes my name. Reese said, So you don't believe hell exists? Gabby looked directly at him. Her eyes had a magnetic quality that made them impossible to look away from, even when their piercing gaze made Reese want to squirm. She said, I've never needed hell's existence to explain anything I've encountered. Upon their arrival, the trio was greeted by the hotel's owner. Philip Bass looked almost nothing like the photos of him online, haggard, in need of a haircut and a shave. Red acne blooms showed through his patchy red beard. The man embodied stress. He invited them into his office and told them all to have a seat. So, you seriously think you guys can get rid of this thing for me? Philip asked as he sat behind his magnificent but abused desk. He kicked one leg over the other and leaned back in his leather chair. What thing? Gabby asked. Well, the the haunting. I don't know what else to call it, sorry. Is that, like, disrespectful or something? I'm not really a big believer myself. The Whitneys exchanged glances that asked, What is this guy on? Reese noticed Philip's pupils were a little too small for his wide eyes. He guessed that in a place like the Hotel Moss, Certain substances weren't too difficult to find. Spending long days in the hotel, Philip probably thought he needed drugs just to get by. Haunted or not, the building was a disaster. So, how would you explain the rash of violent deaths which have occurred here? Gabby asked. They're bad enough they fit the news, even in a city like this, Darian added. Let's do some simple math there, Philip said smugly. The mayor shoves a bunch of... He cleared his throat. Are you filming already? Reese shook his head, but Darian nodded uncomfortably. Philip looked down and saw the young man had his phone on his lap, propped up on his wrist. We try to film everything when we're on location, Darian explained. Philip rolled his eyes. All right, then. The mayor places a bunch of migrants in my hotel. A hotel which, like it or not, has not been full in decades and suddenly violent crime rates spike. However could that have happened? But it's not like nothing awful had ever happened here before, Reese argued. He found he already despised the guy sitting across from him. 
To be upset that your for-profit hotel had been essentially turned into a charity against your will was understandable, but to have such disdain for the human being stuck there seemed inhumane. No, and that's why you're here, Philip said. So when the next journalist with nothing better to do comes crawling in here, I can tell them I recruited a team to investigate the paranormal angle. You can all do your Scooby-Doo skit, and we'll say the haunting is over. Then, maybe we'll be able to reopen 349. Most of the bodies have been dumped there because people believe in all this demonic crap. Darian, growing anxious, cut in. So what do we have access to while we're here? Like, are all the rooms occupied? Do any of the guests know we're here, or why? Well, for your convenience, I've made 249 available for the next two nights. Here. He slid two key cards across the table. That one's for 349, and that one's for 249. If anyone asks, the plumbing issue is still being fixed. What about 449? Gabby asked. 449? Philip echoed. His face cinched around his nose in faint confusion. We've never had a problem in that room. Nothing you'd care about anyway. All right. Gabby looked to each of the Whitneys in turn, sending a message they didn't understand. Philip said, There's a curfew. Everyone's got to be in their rooms by 11 each night. I'll make sure security knows you're all exempt. So tell me, what exactly are you going to do up there? Investigate, Gabby said, standing. That is what you invited us here for, isn't it? They left Philip in his office and walked to the beautiful elevator. It looked like no one had polished any surface in the hotel for weeks, including the elevator, but as the doors closed, they all imagined what it would look like cleaned up. I should ask, Gabby said, once they were secluded inside the elevator, have you two ever resolved a haunting before? Actually, yeah, answered Darian. A while back, we were invited to this house with husband and wife spirits, and we put the wife to rest. The husband was a real piece of work, and we're not totally sure what happened to him, but he doesn't mess with that house anymore. I don't remember that one, Gabby said distantly, then snapped too, staring forward. Oh, have you seen our videos? Reese asked skeptically. Gabby Pons, to the Whitney's surprise and delight, blushed. Reese, she's a fan, Darian laughed. Gabby said with the faintest hint of a smile, I've been impressed with your methods and, I guess, charmed by your humor. I wouldn't have reached out to you if I wasn't a... All right, a fan. She blushed deeper. That's awesome, and really cool because we've studied your work a lot. You've been a big influence, Reese replied. But yeah, we made a video from that house, but we never published it because... Darian? Looking at his oily, warped reflection, Darian said... I sort of got possessed by the wife's spirit. The husband took over a friend of ours. It happened when we were asleep and Reese had to figure out how to get us back. The door opened on the third floor. They all stared down the hall towards the infamous room 349. Gabby's rosy cheeks quickly faded. Do not go to sleep here, she told Darian. If you were that susceptible before, you'll be twice as susceptible now. Wait, really? Darian asked. I studied psychology before I was let go. I came to understand that our conscious minds are tethered to our unconscious spirit. I believe that tether can be broken, such as in various types of mental disorders or, also, through paranormal intervention. The tether can also be repaired, as you've experienced, but once broken, it is never as strong. So you think Philip's wrong, then? You still believe this place is haunted? Reese asked. Gabby stood in solemn silence. Muted sounds of activity bled through the walls. Coughs, brief exclamations, human sounds. But throughout them was an underlying tone. Not one that could be heard with the ears, but with some type of sense in the gut. Gabby did not need to answer Reese's question for him to understand. We'll be careful, Darian said. We can't let these people down. Man, I didn't realize how serious this was going to be, Reese replied. We just wanted to investigate this hotel because of all the stories and stuff, but... Now we're here to save lives, Gabby finished. Down the hall, a door slammed, 
but they hadn't seen any open. They all watched with curious apprehension until they decided no one was coming out. Gabby said, Let's wait to look at the rooms. Since the guests are up and about right now, I suggest we talk to a few of them to get their opinions. It sounded like a reasonable enough plan. They walked the halls of the third floor, then took the stairs to the fourth, which looked about 50 years older than the third. It had clearly been neglected for some time and probably only reopened to house the immigrants. A man came out of one room, but he did not understand English well enough to converse. They kept walking. Hang on, I want to check here, Gabby said, stopping outside of 449. Reese, closest to the door, shrugged and knocked. A woman answered the door. A small boy hid behind her leg. She gave a hesitant greeting in English and said her name was Adriana. Gabby introduced herself and the brothers. May I ask, has anything strange happened in your room? Gabby asked. No, mine, Adriana replied. She pointed at the floor. Down. Down? In the room under you? Reese asked. Adriana nodded vigorously. I hear sound at night, very loud. My son say he hear talking. He hears people talking? Darian asked, pointing at the child for clarity. The woman obviously spoke English as a second language. She was pretty good at it, but Darian wanted to make sure they were understanding her clearly. Her child peered cautiously from behind her leg. His abnormally large eyes stopped on Darian. Darian responded by kneeling down on one knee to match the child's level. Before he could say anything, the boy pointed to the floor and whispered. Sorry, buddy, what was that? Darian asked, tipping his ear toward the boy. The boy took a step closer and whispered, El Diablo. Darian gave him what he hoped was a comforting nod and stood. By the looks on Reese and Gabby's faces, they had also heard the child. Now it was Gabby's turn to kneel. What's your name? She asked. Anthony, he replied with a small voice. Gabby said, Do you know what, Anthony? I have heard some devils too. I've been around all sorts of scary things. And look at me. I'm all right. The boy gave her a shy smile. Do you know what the trick is? Gabby asked him. If you are strong and brave, that voice you hear cannot hurt you. While the boy only understood a handful of Gabby's words, he fully comprehended their meaning. His shy smile grew into a confident grin even as he slipped back behind his mother. Gabby asked Adriana, May we speak for a moment? After a stilted conversation aided by Reese's rusty high school Spanish, the group decided one of them would come back to room 449 that night to have someone listen from there and keep the family safe. The woman, Adriana, wanted to help them in any way she could. She told them, if nothing else, she would pray. Keep going up? Reese asked once the trio was alone again. I would actually prefer to see the rooms before sunset, Gabby said. Reese looked at his watch and was surprised to find it was already almost four. They went back down to the second floor and found room 249. Inside, the room had been updated to modern standards, at least as much as any of the rooms. Still, it bore a slight weight, a density in the air familiar to all three of them from other haunted locations. Reese and Darian used it to record the intro for their video. Gabby held the camera. They discussed a few stories of people hearing noises and voices coming from the room above, which covered most of what made 249 interesting. When it came time to leave, all three of them privately experienced a resistance to abandoning the seemingly safe room. Despite the aforementioned weight in the air, they did not feel unwelcome. 249 felt like a sanctuary. I have a feeling this room will seem quite different in the dark, Gabby pointed out. Let's get upstairs before we lose the last daylight. The numbers 349 looked just like all the others on the wall. The door a clone of every other door in the hotel. But something about the room seemed different, even from the hallway. Perhaps it tripped an unobservable sense directly connected to the subconscious. The magnetic card reader 
looked completely out of place on the old wooden door, but it worked when Darian swiped their card. A green light flashed, indicating the door between them and the supposed portal to hell was unlocked. Whoa, Darian whispered as the door swung inward. Even if the room was not a portal to hell, it could take you to the late 19th century. The floorboards were faded and scuffed, the walls covered in peeling wallpaper. A four-post bed dominated the main room with what Gabby thought were oil lamps on either side of it. Reese reached in for the light switch and found there wasn't one. The group explored the relatively large room in silence. 349 had clearly been constructed to be more than a standard hotel room. It had fallen a long way from its 1867 glory, but it still commanded respect. However, it also felt excitingly uncomfortable. Darian was reminded of how he had felt when he and Reese used to explore abandoned properties, which usually involved a fair bit of trespassing. He opened a skinny closet, expecting to find it empty, but surprisingly found a folding wheelchair propped against the corner. There's a power here, Gabby said. It feels like a magnet, doesn't it? I just wish I could figure out where it's drawing us. Reese peeked into the bathroom, which also had not been updated for decades, if ever. The toilet's water tank was mounted high above the throne, with a long, flushing chain hanging from it. You think this even works? he asked. Gabby pulled back a heavy curtain to let the waning daylight in. Answering Reese, Darian said, I wouldn't want to try. Gabby cut him short with a shrill outburst between a scream and a gasp. The former professor had been so confident, almost stoic, before, that her sudden shriek sent both of the Whitney's hearts racing. They saw she had fallen back against the bed and was staring through the window. What, what, what? Darian panted. Gabby swallowed and shook her head, never taking her eyes off of the window. Reese rushed to her side, worried she might be experiencing a medical emergency. I'm sorry, can we leave, please? Gabby asked. Yeah, we can go, Reese reassured her. He took her arm and helped her stand. Then they followed Darian into the hallway. Gabby grabbed the door on her way out and closed it firmly. What happened? Reese asked. The hallway was empty, but they could once more hear the muted sounds of activity from all directions. They hadn't noticed how quiet it was inside the room. Well, Gabby trailed off, appearing to wander away from her thoughts, then snapping back. There is definitely something very intelligent and probably very powerful in that room. We need to be especially careful in there. How do you know? Darian asked. Gabby looked at him. He no longer saw the strong woman he had spent the rest of the day with. He saw someone tired, afraid, and... Sad? She said, I saw someone, something, she quickly amended her statement, that resembled someone I used to know. Someone close? Reese asked. I would rather not say any more. I'm sorry. I'll tell you more if it becomes pertinent. Gabby asked if they could go down to the lobby so she could use the restroom. While she was gone, Reese and Darian reviewed the videos they had taken of 349 with their phones to see if they had caught whatever Gabby saw on camera. Reese had been filming the old bathroom when Gabby shrieked, but Darian had been zooming in on the enormous bed. When Gabby reacted to whatever she saw, he had flinched and his phone had tilted toward the window. At the exact moment Gabby stumbled back, his camera had captured about three inches of one side of the glass. What's that? Reese asked, pointing to something in the reflection. Darian squinted. It looked like a tall coat rack, but with a white rectangle about the size of a shoebox mounted on top. And instead of peeling wallpaper, the wall next to the object was dressed in brilliant white paint. Just then, the bathroom door opened and Gabby emerged with puffy pink blotches around her eyes. The brothers acted like they didn't notice, and Gabby pretended she believed them. She cleared her throat. I was not prepared for what I saw up there, but now I know what types of tricks to expect. We have our work cut out for us here, boys. They decided to split for dinner. The brothers had originally wanted to eat with Gabby, 
to learn more about her background and what drew her into paranormal investigation, so much so that she was fired over it. But they could tell she needed some time to herself. After a meal and a brief respite at the Holiday Inn, where they were storing their gear and planning to rest between investigations, the trio returned to the Hotel Moss. Still hours before curfew, the lobby was abuzz with activity. A group of children weaved through the investigators as they lugged their duffel bags of equipment to the elevator. This time, the elevator did not open on command, because it was coming from the fifth floor. We still haven't been up that far, Darian pointed out. You don't want to go to the fifth floor if you don't have to, a custodian said behind them. All three turned toward him with questioning glances. Place is a wreck, he explained. Name a crime, it's happened up there. Cops cleared out the junkies and hookers for the immigrants, but they still creep back up there. Mayor's giving them an endless supply of customers and ain't gonna send none of them to jail, so can't blame them. Thanks for the heads up, Reese said. The elevator opened, and the custodian dismissed them with a nod. Should we go up to the fifth floor and check it out? Darian asked as they stepped into the elevator. Definitely not with all this equipment, Reese said, pressing three. I read everything that guy just said online, too. I don't think he was exaggerating. The fifth floor should not concern us tonight, Gabby said. Issues of crime and vice are not why we're here. Perhaps if we manage to remove the supernatural plague that's infected this building, light will be allowed in to banish the shadows. I like that, Darian said. We're here to banish the shadows. Banishing shadows at the Hotel Moss would be a catchy title, Reese pointed out. Well, you can have that one for free, Gabby laughed. I wasn't trying to be profound. The elevator door opened on the third floor. Nobody moved. They stood frozen for so long the doors began to shut, forcing Reese to stick out his arm to hold them. Only then did they hesitantly exit the elevator. With the night, a heaviness had settled into the hotel, consuming even the well-lit hallway. The Whitneys started toward 349, but Darian realized Gabby wasn't following them. He stopped and turned back to her. She said, If you don't mind, I'd like to be the one to stay with Adriana and Anthony upstairs. It might help me gain a better understanding of what's happening here to observe from a distance. I trust you two can keep each other safe? We've gotten each other this far, Reese said. He unzipped his bag and extracted a camera for Gabby. She took it and returned to the elevator. All right, just us, Darian said when the elevator's motor began to hum. Just us and a creepy old room, Reese replied. He started filming and talking to the camera as he and Darian entered room 349 once again. This time they noticed the noises they could hear in the hallway disappear. They unpacked all the usual equipment, stationary cameras, electromagnetic frequency detectors, EVP readers to record voices, REM pods and cat balls to detect touch and motion, and enough LED lights to hopefully get them through the night. Darian unpacked a set of three walkie-talkies and swore. He held one of the devices up for Reese to see and said, I forgot to give one to Gabby. Just run it up to her real quick. I'll be fine for a minute, said Reese. A minute? Dude, it'll take me like five minutes to get back here at least. Look, I really want to get these cameras set up before we go anywhere, Reese said. Okay, so set up one camera, then we go upstairs together. Deal? Reese begrudgingly agreed and turned back to the tripod he was unfolding. Once he aimed the camera, turned on its light, and hit record, he and Darian left for the fourth floor. The elevator was down in the lobby, so the brothers took the stairs. They knocked at 449, and Adriana let them in. Gabby was sitting on the bed, reading a battered children's book to little Anthony. He looked ready to fall asleep. You two set up all of your equipment already? She asked as Darian approached. He held out a walkie, and she accepted it without question. Darian said, No, I wanted to make sure you had that first. Gabby noted Reese's frustrated expression and said, Thank you. It was smart not to split up. Anthony tugged aggressively at her sleeve and beckoned her ear to his lips. He whispered, I think he's down there. 
a crisp, crunching impact traveled through the floor. Gabby shooed the brothers away, but they were already sprinting past Adriana out of the room. They used the stairs again, taking multiple at a time. Go, go, Reese shouted as if Darian could run any faster. In front of the door, they listened helplessly to items, likely their equipment, being thrown about. Reese struggled to insert the keycard, and when he did, it took the reader an excruciatingly long second to change from red to green. He pushed down the handle and shoved the door open. He ducked, and Darian barely copied him in time to dodge a spinning EMF reader. It smashed against the wall across the hallway and landed, splitting open and spilling its AA batteries. The camera reset up had fallen over. Its white LED light gave the room crisp, tall shadows. It illuminated one object in particular, which stopped the Whitney brothers from entering any further. The folded wheelchair from the closet had been opened and rolled into the middle of the room. It sat facing them, surrounded by their broken equipment. Is somebody in here? Reese yelled into the room. Dude, don't provoke him, Darian whispered. I think he's already pretty provoked, Reese retorted. Why'd you break all our stuff? You don't want us figuring out what's going on here? One of the REM pods, a cylindrical device about as wide as a palm, crackled to life and emitted green light from one of its four small indicator bulbs. Its antenna had snapped when it had apparently landed upside down, but apparently it was still functioning. The antenna was supposed to detect movement within a certain radius, as well as touch. It silenced after a few seconds, either succumbing to the damage or signaling the departure of whatever spirit had been near it. It's awfully quiet down there, Gabby said through the walkies. We're okay, answered Darian. Things are kicking off a lot faster than we expected. During this interaction, Reese proceeded further into the room. We don't mean any disrespect, he said, speaking into every corner. We just want to understand what's happening so we can help the people stuck here. A metallic click prompted Darian to shout Reese's name. Reese turned to see his brother pointing a shaking finger at the wheelchair. That wheel just unlocked, Darian said. Right as you said that, it unlocked. Reese stepped back. The wheelchair inched forward. Reese whispered over his shoulder to Darian, Grab whatever you can and go, quick. Not taking his eyes off the wheelchair, Darian looped his foot through the strap of one of the duffels and dragged it towards himself. Unfortunately, when he lifted the bag, he didn't notice his walkie-talkie drop to the floor. Boys? Gabby called. Neither of them answered until they were out in the hallway with the door closed. Boys, can you hear me? We're here, we're okay, Reese finally replied. But listen, whatever's inside 349 is super active and pissed that we're here. I really don't think we should be in there right now. Then come upstairs, there's plenty going on up here, Gabby replied. We can't just run, dude. This is the best evidence we've ever seen, Darian pleaded. I know, I just... Didn't you feel really threatened in there? I felt like something really wanted to hurt us. But that doesn't mean it can. You don't know that. What about the hub? Didn't you bring it so we can watch the cameras in there? Reese shook his head. I hadn't gotten it set up yet. There's still a chance that camera in there is recording, though. We just have to hope. If you aren't on your way yet, I really think you two should see what's happening up here, Gabby called. The brothers exchanged anxious glances before returning to the stairs. Gabby let the boys in and led them to where Adriana was sitting on the floor with Anthony rubbing his back. Anthony's cheeks were streaked with tears, but his soft jaw was set in determined grit. What's going on? Darian quietly asked Gabby. She said, It's incredible. Absolutely amazing. And don't worry, I've caught almost everything on camera. Startlingly loud, Anthony suddenly said, They ran back to you! Who ran back? Reese asked, thinking the boy was talking to him and Darian. You did, Gabby answered. He's hearing voices in 349. The spirits below us are speaking through him. 
No way, Darian gasped. Reese looked at Adriana and tilted his head empathetically, asking, Are you okay with this? Gabby say he will be all right, Adriana replied with an accepting shrug. Reese slipped Gabby a searching glance, but she refused to look his direction. I scared them, Anthony said. Darian asked Reese if he was filming, then sat on the floor beside the young boy. Anthony, are you feeling okay? He asked. The boy looked at him nervously but nodded. Okay, just remember you can stop whenever you want. The boy nodded again. Darian's eyes shifted to the floor, and he asked, Are we speaking with Orville Moss? Anthony instantly replied, I am Andrew. Andrew is Orville's son, Reese said. He recalled the hotel's history, how it had been constructed by Orville Moss, then left to his son Andrew after Orville died on its opening night. Andrew had lived in room 349, and most of the legends claim he lured victims there as sacrifices to carry out something his father started. We've heard a lot of people have been dying here lately, Darian said. Before he could formulate another question, Anthony started speaking again. Nobody misses them, the little boy said. I give them a great... He's talking too fast. That's all right, Gabby said. Just say as much as you can. Andrew Moss apparently heard Anthony's complaint and adjusted to accommodate for the child's simple language skills. Through Anthony, he said, They break, they bleed, they scream, just like this little boy will? Little Anthony's eyes widened. Enough, Adriana snapped. She picked Anthony up and carried him to the bed, setting him on her lap and snuggling his head against her chest. Below them came a long, metallic groan. It sounded how the Whitneys supposed that old folding wheelchair might sound if someone heavy were being pushed around in it. The groaning stopped directly below Gabby. Anthony suddenly pulled away from his mother. He looked at Gabby questioningly and said, He asked if you like seeing your daughter today. Confused, Reese turned his camera away from Anthony and pointed it at Gabby, but Darian pushed it down. He had noticed Gabby's instant reaction, one of shock and, was it grief? He didn't think she would want it shown to millions of viewers. Catching on, Reese said, Gabby? Don't listen to him anymore, Gabby instructed Anthony. To the Whitneys, she said, I'll be right back. They heard her choke back a sob as she hurried out of the hotel room. As soon as she was gone, Reese's walkie-talkie hissed to life. At first, it was just static, but then a clear voice broke through, screaming. It sounded like a man, and he didn't sound like he was going to survive whatever was happening to him. Then another scream cut through. A woman. Her agonized howling made Reese instinctively turn the walkie down. He looked at poor Anthony and saw his own feelings reflected on the child's face. Gabby rushed back in, the bags under her eyes dampened with tears. She held out her walkie and asked, Did you all hear that too? Reese nodded. Darian said, I dropped mine on the way out of the room. It must be, The gateway to hell is in 349, said a new, deep, and distorted voice from the walkie-talkie. The screams disappeared, replaced by what might have been a howling wind or rushing river. Then, You will all pass through. Gabby turned her walkie off and pointed at Reese to do the same. Below them, the floor shook. Adriana started praying, clutching Anthony's hands in her own. Gabby let them be and gestured for the Whitneys to follow her into the bathroom. It was the only place in the hotel room that offered any privacy. I didn't know you had a daughter, Darian said. Gabby replied, Not many do. She was born to me very young and passed away long before I achieved any notoriety. Leukemia took her when she was five years old. I'm so sorry, Reese said as fresh tears brimmed in Gabby's eyes. They're trying to use her against me, Gabby said, holding back her emotions. I saw her in the window downstairs. They made me see her sick and dying again. 
I've spent years washing that image from my mind. I just thought you should know because, if I'm being honest with you and myself, my confidence has been shaken. It's impossible for me to explain, but by using my daughter... A tiny knock rattled the bathroom door. Darian opened it a crack and saw Anthony standing on the other side, looking anxious and pale. Everything okay, buddy? Darian asked. Without looking up, Anthony said, Someone down there is laughing. He say we all gonna die. The investigative team spent the rest of the night in 449. They encouraged Anthony to stop listening to the voices below. Reese gave the boy his phone and AirPods and let him watch shows on Netflix until he fell asleep. While Anthony slept, Gabby explained her theory as best she could to Adriana. The language barrier made the complex and intangible details difficult to share, but by the early morning hours, Adriana seemed to grasp the basic idea. Around 4 a.m., the team told her they needed to go rest. Adriana thanked them and bid them farewell. At the Holiday Inn, the group agreed to reconnect at 2 in the afternoon, then separated to their rooms. Unable to sleep at first, the Whitney brothers filmed a short clip explaining their renewed passion for resolving the Hotel Moss's oppression. Time alone had the opposite effect on Gabby Pons, though. Boys, I hate myself for saying this. Truly, I do. I resent myself for this weakness of character, but I do not think it wise for me to join you tonight, she said when they reunited for lunch. Reese nearly shouted, What? Gabby, we don't stand a chance without you. He looked around, hoping nobody noticed and recognized him from the channel. Well, this is life or death, Gabby replied grimly. For Adriana and little Anthony, whatever you do tonight could save their lives. So why are you bailing on them? Darian hit back. Gabby opened her mouth, closed it, looked down, then met his eyes again, her own filled with sorrow. She said, No spirit or entity has ever looked into me the way these have, not deep enough to find my greatest pain and use it against me. Your daughter? Reese asked carefully. Sylvia, Gabby confirmed. I suppose that the deepest level my fascination with the paranormal can be traced back to losing her. I wondered, what if there is an afterlife? What if Sylvia is out there somewhere and what if she still needs me? Gabby took a deep breath before continuing. Since then, I've confirmed at a minimum the existence of another plane to which human spirits can go after death. I've been there, Darian uttered quietly. Gabby acknowledged him with a brief nod. So then my questions changed, she continued. I started exploring how I could access those planes, how I could find my daughter, and in all my years of searching, I've never seen or heard any sign of her. Until last night. Last night when I saw her reflected in the window. I saw her as she was when she died, tied to all those machines and barely alive like a living ghost. I thought that if I ever found her, she would be whole again, surrounded by a bright light. I never imagined she would spend eternity dying. But that wasn't really her, Darian said. She wasn't actually there, it was just an illusion. Which is what I keep telling myself. Gabby cut in. But how can I ever know what is an illusion and what is not? That question is all I've been able to think about since I saw her. What if, tonight, they show me her in agony? What if they can convince me that she's spending eternity suffering? I fear that no matter what I tell myself now, that would be an image I could not shake. It would end me. They were all quiet then. Neither of the brothers could think of anything to say. They wanted to convince Gabby not to leave them. They both feared facing the hotel without her level-headed confidence and force of will, but they saw a broken woman crumbling before their eyes. Finally, Reese said, If you think it's best, we'll do what we can on our own. If we can't fix anything, we can always try to find somewhere else for Adriana and her kid to go. Gabby asked the brothers, Do you believe in hell? I mean, as much as anything else supernatural, Reese answered. Darian said, 
We've brushed against some pretty intense and evil stuff, so I guess I do. I don't, Gabby said flatly. The brothers both raised their eyebrows. I believe there are dark and, yes, even evil forces out there, but I believe that evil comes from within us. Inside of people, I mean. So when someone like Orville Moss, who by all counts was a terrible man, passes on, they take that negativity with them. Think about it this way. A good person with nothing but positive intentions would likely die at peace, right? But someone greedy, cruel, and narcissistic, well, that person would likely never experience peace. Therefore, they go to the grave with unfinished business. In Orville's case, he gave his life to the power connected to the land on which the Hotel Moss was built. He passed the mantle to his equally fiendish son, and the pain he caused here has left a permanent impression in the spiritual atmosphere of the hotel. Darian said, So all the gateway to hell stuff was just a wicked old man trying to scare us, Gabby finished. References to hell and the devil make us connect what's happening here to a biblical evil. They're meant to distract us from the truth, the real evil, which is the moss men themselves. And they want us to believe there's something bigger going on? Reese asked. Yes and no. Gabby replied. They might really be tapped into something bigger. I didn't think they were until... until they showed me my daughter in the window. No one felt very hungry after that, so they left the restaurant shortly. Outside of the Holiday Inn, the Whitneys bid Gabby farewell before going up to their room to prepare for the intense night ahead. As sunset approached, the Whitney brothers hurried to room 349 at the Hotel Moss. They weren't sure the daylight could protect them from anything, but it seemed smart to prepare their equipment before the sun went down anyway. When they unlocked the door, for the first time since being attacked the previous night, they found much of their gear had been broken, including the only camera that had been recording. All of the cat balls had been crushed. The spirit box's top was dented. It still turned on but wouldn't make any sound. Only the REM pods were seemingly untouched, except for the one which had already been damaged. The EMF detectors were scuffed up and one had its batteries scattered on the floor, like the one that had been tossed into the hallway, but both devices still worked. The wheelchair was still out, but it now sat facing the corner across from the bed. They decided to check on Adriana and Anthony, but left when their knocks received no answer. They assumed the mother and son were either out of the building or, hopefully, resting. We should check out 249 again with what's left, Reese suggested. Anything that did not involve going back to 349 yet sounded good to Darian, so to the second floor they went. They passed people in the halls looking haggard and frightened. Many of the guests gave the brothers and the devices in their hands wary glances as they passed. The guests' vacant eyes made the brothers wonder what sorts of horrors those who did not have an option to leave were being put through every night. While Reese walked around 249, checking for rogue electromagnetic frequencies, Darian sat on the bed with a recorder to conduct a solo EVP session. He pressed record and started asking questions, waiting in between each one to give space for inaudible spirits to answer. He asked, Is there anybody in this room? Pause. How many of you are here? Pause. Did you die here? Pause. Do you want to hurt people? Pause. And finally, are you able to leave? Reese came over to listen as Darian played the audio back. Is there anybody in this room? A shuffling or scratching noise that neither of the brothers had caused played back. How many of you are here? A raspy voice whispered. Dozens. Darian shivered so hard he almost dropped the device. That was clear as day, Reese gasped. Darian let the playback continue. Did you die here? Killed. Do you want to hurt people? No. Are you able to leave? trapped. Dozens of murdered people are still trapped in this room, Reese summarized. Darian tagged on. They say they don't mean any harm, so I'm guessing these are just the victims. 
The electromagnetic frequency reader in Reese's hand spiked so suddenly he dropped it on the mattress. He asked, Is that right? Are you the victims of Orville and Andrew Moss? The device spiked again. Darian pressed record on the recorder again and asked, Why did they trap you here? He thought for a second, then also asked, Will you help us remove them from the hotel? Upon playback, they heard, Why did they trap you here? There was a slight delay, then one word. Power. Will you help us remove them from the hotel? Utter silence. Does that mean they won't help us, or they just won't say it out loud? Reese asked. Darian shrugged helplessly. They continued to communicate with the spirits, not capturing any more audio, but receiving intelligent responses with their other equipment. For the first time, they felt like they were doing a normal investigation. They filmed enough content that even if the rest of the footage from the hotel was unusable, they would still have something to publish when they got home. As an unintentional result of the 249 investigation, the Whitney brothers regained the confidence they had lost when Gabby left them. They were reminded of their own abilities and of how much they could rely on one another. They collected their equipment and reluctantly returned to room 349. It had gotten dark outside, and since there were no electric lights installed in the infamous room, the Whitneys worked mostly in the dark. They had their phone flashlights and a couple of LEDs for the cameras, but those bright white lights also made the shadows longer. Hey, do you hear something? Darian asked. Reese, surprised they had been able to work so long uninterrupted, stopped to listen. He thought he heard someone crying, but couldn't tell where it was coming from. Darian asked, Is that? But before he could finish, the remaining REM pods and the EMF readers went off at the same time. The audio recorder in Darian's hand turned itself on. Reese pointed this out when he noticed its tiny digital display counting seconds. Over the whine of the REM pods, the brothers could still hear someone crying. Then, all at once, everything but the sobs went silent. The audio recorder was still counting, but Reese told Darian he should shut it off and play back whatever had recorded during the eruption of activity. Darian did so. For the first few seconds, they heard only the whining noises they had heard with their own ears. Then, a voice that sounded very close to the recorder growled, I have the boy now. Anthony. The brothers looked at each other, then up at the ceiling. The crying was coming from 449. They ran straight there, not bothering to take any gear with them. This time, when they knocked, Adriana answered the door, distraught, and ushered them in. I woke up and find him like this now, she sobbed. I don't know what to do. Little Anthony was lying on the floor behind the bed in the shape of a star. His eyes were closed, but he did not appear to be sleeping. His face was taut, his lips curled in discomfort. Anthony, can you hear me? Reese asked. He was afraid to touch him. The boy's limbs looked stiff, as if electrified to the floor. Reese flashed back to the night he had been unable to wake Darian and their friend Gage. That was the night he almost lost his brother forever. He had gotten Darian and Gage back, though, and he was determined to do the same for this child. Please help me, Adriana cried, kneeling beside Reese and laying her body over her sons. We will, Reese replied, but he had no idea how. A taxi stopped in front of the Hotel Moss, a rare event. A woman opened the door and got out. She carried her suitcase to the entrance as the taxi drove away. She rushed by the unmanned front desk, rounded the corner, and proceeded directly to the management office. No one stopped her. Philip Bass sat in the dark, illuminated only by the glow of his laptop. He looked up when he heard his door open. When he saw who had entered, saw the aggression in her narrowed eyes and taut lips, he stood. That's close enough, he stammered. Gabby Pons furiously demanded, How much did you tell them about me? Philip held his palms out, innocently turned upward. I have no idea what you're talking about. Don't play dumb with me, you yuppie idiot. 
Why did you tell them about my daughter? Philip's eyebrows pinched. Gabby continued, I spent my entire ride to the airport wondering how they knew and I could only think of one answer. Oh, please do enlighten me, Philip replied, sitting back down casually. You didn't bring us here to get rid of the mosses. You're working with them. I wondered when we first met you and you reacted so suspiciously to my mention of room 449. You researched my past and told them about my daughter so they could use her against me, didn't you? And why would I do that? To get rid of me. To get me out of the way. But why? Philip asked again. Gabby faltered. She stared into Philip's eyes, angry flames burning behind her own. Truthfully, she could not understand why the hotel's owner would bring her there just to send her away. She didn't know why he had invited her or the Whitney brothers to the hotel when it was already packed with potential victims. She had hoped to formulate a more complete theory before this confrontation, but there she was, standing before Philip Bass without an answer. Certain she could not connect the dots on her own, Philip grinned. You're too self-important, Professor. You remind me of my dad. Gabby stayed silent and watched him warily. You're all in your head wondering, why me? Why is he paying me all of this attention? Did you ever stop to wonder if maybe they removed you to get what they really want? Did you ever think maybe you're so unimportant that you aren't even worth killing? But the boys are, Gabby wondered aloud. So why turn them down for so long? Why wait for me to make the call? Again exaggerating your own role in this, Philip nearly shouted. Gabby sensed that, despite his smarmy confidence, he was compensating for something. He said, I thought that our current situation might resolve itself sooner. I hoped we might be able to wait to bring the boys here until the hotel was empty again. With so many people here, I'm just not sure what's going to happen. I was trying to avoid ending up in the news. Why do they want the Whitneys? Gabby asked. She was growing nervous, wondering if the boys were already upstairs facing whatever trap Philip and the Mosses had laid for them. Philip said, Their mother's maiden name is Joyce. Does that help? Gabby shook her head. Their grandmother, Evelyn Joyce, was born to a woman named Annabelle. In her previous life, Annabelle Joyce went by Joy and worked on the fifth floor of this hotel. She eventually found herself working exclusively for Andrew Moss. He was stuck in that wheelchair, you know. One day, she suddenly came upon enough money to move far away all on her own. She had her daughter Evelyn just a few months later. Do I need to spell it out anymore for you? So, Reese and Darian are the great-grandchildren of Andrew Moss, Orville Moss's great great grandchildren. Somehow I don't think it's a coincidence that they've been so successful in what they do. It's all been leading them to... Gabby trailed off, her eyes connecting to Phillips with furious determination. You're coming with me, or I'll pull the fire alarm, she threatened. Phillips' eyes narrowed at this threat. At first, he made no move to stand, but when Gabby spun on her heels and reached for the door, he shot up. I can't let you interfere, he said anxiously. Gabby asked, What did they promise you? Riches? Power? Trust me when I say you want nothing that comes from those men. Look what they've gotten you so far. See how they've used you? What do you have to show for it besides innocent blood all over your hands? Come with me. Redeem yourself. I didn't kill those people, Philip replied weakly. Didn't you? He couldn't answer. After a hurried return to 349 to collect some equipment, the Whitney brothers began working to rescue little Anthony. It's like pulling him down, Darian grunted, trying to force his fingers beneath Anthony's stiff body. He's like a magnet. Reese fidgeted with the tablet in his hands, the one their cameras all connected to. He was trying to see inside 349, but glitches and errors kept stalling him. He swore at the device when the feed almost displayed, then went black after a flash of static. Where is Gabby? Adriana asked. She couldn't come back with us, Darian explained. 
It's just us now. I stay with him, she replied, kneeling beside her son. You go make this stop. Darian stood and tapped Reese on the shoulder. Neither of them wanted to leave the mother and child alone, but they knew better than to split up. They left Adriana, one of the walkies, then hurried down to 349. The door opened for them. Reese and Darian stood in the hallway, watching the door swing inward, inviting them into the shadowy room. For the sake of the unconscious boy upstairs, they stepped inside. I can feel it, Darian immediately said. It does feel like a magnet, and it's like tugging on my chest. He felt through the darkness, stumbling further inside with Reese close behind. He couldn't see anything. To him, the room had become unnaturally dark, as if a black mist had been sprayed into the air with an aerosol can. Reese had a hard time seeing it first, but his eyes slowly adjusted. He did not understand why Darian was still feeling around blindly. Trying to help, he turned on his phone light. Still, Darian held his hands out and took tiny, hesitant steps. Can you see it all? Reese asked. Yeah, but not more than, like, a few inches out. Can you? Reese clutched the back of Darian's t-shirt to establish physical contact. He knew Darian had a connection to a paranormal dimension and couldn't have him wandering through some portal by accident. It looks normal to me, Reese said. He raised his walkie and asked Adriana if anything had changed upstairs. When she answered that nothing had, Darian tensed. I heard him, he whispered whipping his head in all directions. I heard Anthony calling for his mom. Anthony, Anthony, can you hear me? Reese tried to listen even though he hadn't heard anyone besides Adriana. Clearly, Darian was tapped into something unavailable to him. Darian said, I need to go further in. He's trying to find me. The boys approached the center of the room, stepping around the bed. Darian's eyes were open, but unfocused and hazy. He kept calling Anthony's name and receiving distant responses. Reese suddenly pulled him back. What is it? Darian asked. The wheelchair. It's turned around. Reese hadn't seen it happen, but he knew the wheelchair had been facing the corner before. Now it was facing them. It wasn't hard to imagine a hostile old man sitting in it, watching them with disgust, plotting his next move. The pull is getting stronger. Darian said. He unknowingly inched toward the wheelchair. No, Darian, don't get any closer. But that's where Anthony is. Darian stepped closer still. Reese thought he heard the seat of the wheelchair depress slightly. Darian shouted, Anthony, come to my... The wheelchair launched from the corner, slamming into Darian's legs and knocking him over. Reese dodged out of the way, but lost his hold on Darian's shirt. The wheelchair swiveled, then shot between them facing Darian. Reese didn't know what to do. He wanted to tell Darian to get out of the room, but he knew his brother would never give up on Anthony. He realized he needed to buy time. Reese grabbed one of the wheelchair's handles and yanked it backward. It dragged as if occupied by a heavy person. Both wheels locked on their own, but Reese shoved all of his weight down on the handles, flipping the chair onto its back and unleashing hell. The room instantly heated up to what felt like 100 degrees. A nauseating odor of sour rot infected the air. Reese doubled over, heaving. He heard Darian retching on the floor. A REM pod lit up for one second before it went flying across the room, nearly striking Reese in the head. Hurry, Anthony, Darian shouted, understanding their time was running short. He crawled closer to the corner, where he felt the strongest draw. It was... He felt confident. The portal. The opening between dimensions. Darian, don't go over there, Reese warned. He felt a wall of invisible fire all around him. The only way he could avoid getting burned was by standing still. I have to, Darian replied. He's close. He's trying to speak, Adriana called through the walkie. What's he saying? Reese asked. Too quiet, I no can understand she replied. Darian could make out shapes moving in the darkness in front of him. Pale silhouettes glowed faintly behind the shadows, and contrasting sharply with the sweltering room, 
the air ahead felt cold. It felt familiar. He realized he had been on the other side of the portal before. It was where he had gone when his soul had been disembodied by a desperate spirit. Was that why he could see it and Reese could not? Darian resolutely said, I have to go in and get him out. Absolutely not. How am I supposed to get you back if you get stuck? You've done it before, and I almost lost you forever. Darian faced his brother and said, If I don't do something, Anthony's going to be lost forever. Reese floundered for words. Behind him, the room door swung open, but he didn't notice. Small objects were now flying all around the room, spiraling in the invisible cyclone of fire. Reese, I have to go repeated Darian. A completely unexpected voice came from behind Reese. Darian Whitney, don't you dare go into that portal. Gabby? Reese whipped around, shocked. When he saw Gabby hurrying forward, leading a begrudging Philip Bass, he wondered if he was experiencing an illusion, a trick. But when the pair entered the room, Reese felt its focus shift to them. The heat around him stopped feeling quite so oppressive, and he was allowed to go to Darian who had also paused in surprise. "'I know your secret, Orville,' Gabby proclaimed. "'You lied to your son. Your power doesn't come from hell. You draw it from the souls you trap here. You've used this hotel as a farm for victims for too long. Tonight, I'm cutting you off.' Philip looked extraordinarily anxious. Reese thought he might try to sneak back out of the room, but just as he was about to move, Gabby grabbed his arm. She said, if you need somebody so badly, why don't you take him? Philip recoiled, but something, something much stronger than Gabby's hand, stopped him from running out of the room. Reese looked on in horror as Philip was shoved toward Darian and the portal. He tripped over the REM pod that had been thrown earlier and caught himself on the bed. He's in his prime, full of energy, Gabby continued, unfazed by having the man torn from her grip. Who knows? The way you've trained him, maybe he can replace your son once Andrew realizes you've used him for nothing but your own gain, in life and in death. Philip hoisted himself up, but something forced him down to the floor on his back. His mouth gaped in a silent scream. During all of this, Darian noticed movement within the portal. One of the pale auras began to coalesce. A human form materialized from the ethereal light becoming more obvious as it approached. The center of this form, where the person's stomach would be, bulged. Distended shapes of light protruded from both sides of the torso, but the figure appeared unbothered. It, she, Darian realized as flowing golden hair materialized on her head, methodically approached the portal's edge. She had a gentle face beneath the veil of her glow. Darian felt he knew this spirit. There was something knowing and familiar in her shrouded eyes. Soon, Darian realized the misshapen parts of her were the limbs of another, smaller figure cradled in her arms. When its face became clear, Darian recognized little Anthony. His golden eyes quivered with fear as the undeniably angelic woman held his small form out to Darian. All Reese and Gabby saw was Darian, entranced, stretching his arms out and stepping forward. Reese threw his arms around his brother and shouted him to stop. Gabby looked ready to jump over Philip to help Reese pull Darian back. She feared she had come too late. Darian fought against his brother until Anthony's ethereal form was in his hands. He yanked the boy to his chest, only then allowing Reese to pull them both away from the portal. The shadowy black maw winked like an enormous eye, and suddenly, Darian could see the room perfectly. Then, with a tiger-like roar, blackness exploded all around him, and the portal opened even wider than before. Philip shot across the room, head first. His shoulder collided with Reese's foot, knocking him off balance and causing both Whitney brothers to fall. Horrified, Darian realized Anthony's form was no longer in his hands. Philip disappeared halfway into the portal. His howling cries were silenced in the physical world, but Darian heard them echoing beyond. Gabby caught one of Philip's legs before it disappeared.
Darien saw the portal wince. He didn't know what else to call it. It shrunk suddenly and pulled itself deeper into the corner. Some of Philip's torso reappeared. Reese recognized his chance and grabbed Philip's other leg. He and Gabby pulled together and dragged the hotel owner back into the physical dimension. The portal stretched and pulsed. Darien stood before it like a sentry, watching it writhe like the mouth of a person in torment. He caught one final flash of the golden woman's vaguely familiar face and thought she might have smiled at him before the weakened portal collapsed. A wisp of something like smoke made a helix in the air, then dissipated. Only when the action in 349 halted did the group notice the rapid and sporadic bumps coming from above. Reese snatched up his walkie and excitedly missed the talk button twice. Adriana, he shouted once his finger found the button. What's going on up there? He did not receive a response, but the bumping continued. It sounded like someone running back and forth. Reese raised the walkie to call again. The speaker crackled to life before Reese pressed anything, and Adriana's hysterically cheerful voice said, He's okay. My boy is okay. Understandably upset at having been used for bait, Philip wanted to abandon the reunited investigative team. Gabby explained to him that if he had actually been fed to the portal and used by the mosses to re-energize their grip on the hotel, it would have spelled the end for all of them. She assured him she never had any intention of letting him go, despite how close they had seemingly come to losing him. She said the real bait had been Anthony, dangled by the mosses to lure in the Whitneys. She told the brothers that she would explain everything. But first, there's another critical step we must take, and we must take it now. In a letter to Andrew, Orville wrote that his lasting power was a reward for the souls he sacrificed to hell. In fact, he claimed to have been made a demon. I don't believe for a second that he, a wealthy but ordinary man, managed to work out such a deal with the devil. I think he created his own version of hell right here in the hotel and appointed himself as its demonic ruler. Darian said, I thought I could feel something coming up from below us when the portal opened. I was really scared that it was actually hell opening up under my, if I'm correct, room 249 is where he's caged his pet souls, Gabby interrupted. He used 349 as a trap and the space directly below it as a prison. They all, including Philip, went to 249 with what functional gear remained. The cameras and audio recorders were trashed, useless. Two of the REM pods were just dead boxes now. The best we can do, Gabby said before opening the door to 249, is to give them the confidence to leave. The Moss's power here is weaker than it's ever been. It will be up to their victims to do the rest. I guess that sort of makes sense, Philip said humbly. I've heard stories of all kinds of weird stuff happening in here. Some of it's really terrifying, but nobody ever died in here. Not as far back as I looked. They all died upstairs. Maybe they wanted to warn people or scare them out of the hotel, Reese wondered. Or maybe something was trying to herd them upstairs, Darian speculated. Gabby gave him a nod, indicating which brother she thought was correct. Darian set up their last REM pod in the middle of the room and asked any present spirits to gather near it. The device's lights flashed, and it whined at full volume. The piercing tone was so strong and steady that Darian had to shut the REM pod off after only a few seconds. Gabby stepped into the center of the room and gave the present spirits a brief explanation of what had just happened in the room above. All you need to know is that the men who trapped you here are drained right now. They may even be powerless for good, but they may also return. We can't know for sure. Each of you needs to make peace with your death, except that you must move on, and then, well, move on. Nothing changed, but Philip shivered violently. Darian thought he felt a rush of cool air pass him, too. He and Reese met each other's eyes. The silence was broken by a squawk from Reese's radio. Through it, Adriana called, Who was that? Reese looked to each of the others, finding them as confused as him. He asked, What do you mean? 
Somebody talk to me. Adriana replied. Somebody on here say thank you. Gabby lit up. She stepped forward and said, If you're still here, you're welcome. But now hurry up and get out of here. When Darian tested the REM pod again, once more requesting any present spirits approach, the device stayed silent. The Whitneys did not have enough salvaged footage to make a very comprehensive video documenting their experience. They put together what they could and recorded a message at the end to try to tie everything together. They shared what Gabby had told them after they had left the Hotel Moss, about their family, and how it tied all the way back to Orville and Andrew themselves. Darian speculated that it had been his great-grandmother, Annabelle Joyce, who had rescued Anthony from the portal and passed him through. They acknowledged how unbelievable their story must seem, regardless of the broken footage of objects flying around Room 349 and their obviously genuine fear throughout the ordeal. But here's a fact, Reese said. Rooms 249, 349, and 449 have all been boarded up. If you go to the Hotel Moss right now, not that we recommend it, Darian cut in. Right. If you went there, though, you'd find those three shut up for good. Philip Bass says there haven't been any more disappearances since we left, but he's not taking any chances. Reese decided to leave out the tag he wanted to add, which was, for now. Darian said, Gabby wants him to tear the whole place down, but I don't think that's going to happen. Not yet, anyway, Reese agreed. But speaking of Gabby, it sounds like she's going to take a break for a while. We hoped we might team up again for another video down the road, you know, one we could actually finish, but yeah, Darian broke in as Reese trailed off. She's got some personal things to work through before she goes out chasing ghosts again. So do we, I guess, Reese said. But then he added, actually, we're going to shut off this camera and get to work on that so we can get back out there as soon as possible. Darian spread his arms toward the invisible audience and concluded, there you go, guys. Just another typical Whitney Bros adventure. We're just out here defeating the forces of evil. Banishing shadows, Reese tagged. Darian nodded. Hopefully for good. If you enjoyed this story, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel. You will get a new story every week if you do. If you feel ready, meet me here next week for another journey into the Warning Woods. Thank you for listening.